Hi, Zach Couples here. I'm from ZachCouples.com, and I'm also a member of the IFAST family. So I have to credit Bill Hartman for making this even a possibility. And today, we're going to talk about helping people achieve their goals. Goals of health and performance. In order to maximize or help their individ an individual reach where they want to go, there are four areas from a health and performance standpoint that we can intervene. The first one, and this is the area that I specialize in, is physical activity. There are other areas as well that will impact to what extent you excel at one of these two domains. Physical activity is one. The second, nutrition. What fuel do you put into your body to help better you here? The third, stress management. What type of interventions do you use to help mitigate the stress response from running rampant? So that could be something such as meditation or having a healthy psychological profile. And then the last thing, one of my other favorites would be sleep. Are you getting enough rest and recovery in order to maximize how well you do in these domains? We're going to talk about physical activity in particular today and what are the pieces, the steps, and components necessary to maximize this area so our individuals can reach both their health and performance goals. From a physical activity standpoint, there is a particular process that we will utilize with our clients to help them reach their health and performance goals. We have four domains in that process that could potentially be rate limiting steps in those physical activity goals. Knowledge, variability, power, and capacity. Let's go into detail with each. The first step in our physical activity process is knowledge. Knowledge is defined as, do I have the requisite understanding to perform a physical action? And let's look at this from both a rehabilitation and performance standpoint, since that's where I know most of us are going to be intervening from. Let's look at this first from a rehabilitation standpoint. So, an example, let's say I have an individual who believes that every time they move they are damaging a particular tissue. That is a deficit in knowledge. So an intervention you may use may be explaining to them or de-threatening a particular movement saying that, look, when you do move, it doesn't necessarily mean you are damaging tissues. Pain is a process there for us to protect ourselves. That could be using that from a rehabilitation standpoint. In the aspect of performance, do, I, do my athletes understand with this exercise what the intent is or what type of cues I'm going to provide or why am I doing this movement and how is it going to help me achieve my goal? If an individual says, why are we doing front squats as an example? I've never done this before. How is this going to help me? and maybe that lack of knowledge is impairing their capability or their desire to perform a front squat, you explaining how that's going to help them get better helps improve that knowledge gap. So that would be examples of when knowledge would be a rate limiting step. The next step in this process is movement variability. And that is the capability to move in desirable ranges. There are two components to variability, passive and active. So passive is, do I have the requisite joint mobility to perform a given task? Active would be, can I utilize that joint mobility in a given task? Now you guys can use whatever system you prefer. We'll just go into detail a little bit about what I do. And so from a passive standpoint, I basically look at one's ability to move both from a dynamical standpoint and, or I, I should say a gross standpoint and a fine standpoint in all three planes, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. 
So there are specific tests that I look at from a lower quadrant standpoint and specific tests that I look at from an upper quadrant standpoint that help tell me where this individual struggles to move in all three planes. And by combining these two, te these two testing algorithms together, it gives me a, a, a total picture of one's movement capabilities. And it allows me to intervene in such a manner that I can improve those movement capabilities given whatever task we're trying to perform. Once I've established passive movement variability to a desirable range, I move to active. There's three tests that I use to establish active movement variability. I use some type of squat pattern, which would be a toe touch to a functional squat. So what I always tell my patients or my clients, this is the crapping in the wood squat. So being able to establish that. That tells me whether someone has full sagittal plane control of a particular joint position. Once I've gotten that adequate, and again, that's going to be idiosyncratic, so I don't know how much an individual needs. I would say for most people, I shoot to being able to squat two parallel or below. The next thing I move into is an active mid-stance test. We'll have a link for this in the notes. But this test tells me, do I have enough pelvic... This test tells me can I control pelvic positioning and coordinate pelvic movements in three planes? So I go to this next. Once I've established a desirable score or control in the active mid-stance test, I then move to the Copenhagen, not Copenhager, but Copenhagen test. And basically what that is, is that is a frontal plane test that, again, builds on the active mid-stance test, but it also shows me when I throw a stressful challenge or try to fatigue an individual, can they maintain the components of the active mid-stance test and the squat without faltering? So once I've gotten these three tests to a desirable scoring system, I know that I can move on to the next step. I don't necessarily have blanket goals for each individual because I'm only going to establish variability insofar as that it helps me achieve my clients or my patients goals. So for example, in a rehabilitation standpoint, I'm going to give someone movement variability insofar as that it helps get them out of pain and allows them to perform whatever basic functions they wish to perform. From a performance lens, I'm going to establish movement variability insofar as that allows me to help them perform whatever performance task we're trying to achieve. For example, let's say I have an individual who can't get into a split squat position first thing I'm going to see is can I coach them out of it or coach them into the desirable position. And let's say that I've failed there. That lends credence to, for me to believe that, okay, maybe we're dealing with a movement variability issue. So I may go through my movement variability algorithm and determine that, okay, this area, this area, and this area are limited. Let me intervene on those areas and see if we get a change. And so, I'm going to give them the variability needed to potentially do the split squat, and then we'll go into the split squat. So that might be an example as to how we utilize movement variability in such a manner that we address that as the rate limiting step for a given task. So is that one thing I'm noticing here is you have your lower quarter and your upper quarter stuff for passive tests of variability, but in your active section, like I've seen you do the Copenhagen and I've seen you do the adduction mid stance and I've seen you do the squat and they look to me like they're very lower quarter 
dominant test. How are you, are you testing upper quarter stuff actively? So really these tests, even though we are predominantly looking at lower, lower quarter coordinative capabilities, there are upper quadrant components to this. So in the squat, for example, as I descend into a squat, I need to ensure that I can actively reach forward to help drive me into position. And so that reaching forward allows me to shift my center of gravity further back. If I can't reach effectively, I'm not going to be able to descend far enough into the squat. So there is where we get an active component that involves the upper quadrant. In the Copenhagen test, because I'm holding a side plank position, I have to isometrically push with my upper extremity into the ground to hold myself upright. And that reach combined with the pressing down of the top side leg into a surface allows me to coordinate transfer between those two areas. So in that sense, we are looking at how well I can drive active movement variability from the upper quadrant. And in a lot of cases, if I have a limitation in an upper quadrant test, I might not be able to achieve those positions due to that limitation. And so what do I do? Well, before I even address this active component, I make sure everything is passively cleared before I even go there. The next step in our process, once we've established a knowledge base and we've given requisite movement variability, is to develop power. I define power as the ability to produce a desirable intensity. Let's look at this from a rehabilitation standpoint and a performance standpoint. From the rehabilitation lens, we're looking at can someone tolerate a given load? For example, I may have an individual who can go overhead without pain, but as soon as I have them try to press, or if we go with a purposeful task, maybe when they're trying to put an object up into a shelf, up, up onto a shelf, they get pain. If variability is there, but once under load, they run into trouble, you got a power problem. So in this case, what we're doing is we're trying to find strategies for our individuals that incorporate external load and be able to express intensity in such a manner that pain is not produced. On the performance side of things, we're looking at, given several different contexts, can individuals produce force and intensity in such a manner that is desirable for optimizing performance. And so this could be a 1RM test of some sort. This could be, can I jump X amount of distance. Or if we even go from outside of a general physical preparation lens to a special, can they perform a given task with enough power? Maybe this is, can they break tackles as a football player? Can they jump high enough to dunk a basketball? These types of qualities. Okay, Zach, so Ty and Tony have talked a lot about power and, and they're chasing power, but sometimes they're chasing force and sometimes they're chasing velocity. Um, do you have any thoughts on, like it seems like if, we're, if you just say power that you're kind of simplifying this for me, where does force and velocity come into play? That's a really good question, Lance. And so with this definition of power, this is a very gross definition, this isn't necessarily force times velocity. I'm encompassing all components necessary to produce intensity. Force is one piece of that. Velocity is another piece of that. And so what you have to determine with your individuals is what power rate limiting step is preventing me from producing a desirable intensity. In some individuals, that could be some type of strength deficit where they just can't produce enough gross force irrespective of time. In other individuals, that could be some of Ty and Tony's work where maybe they can produce enough force, but they can't do it fast enough. And so then we have to chase velocity in that regard. Or maybe it's just a matter of they can't coordinate a movement 
under load. I would still classify that as a power problem because they cannot achieve the desired movement once load occurs. It's the same thing on the rehabilitation side where maybe they can achieve the desired movement but it hurts. Those are two problems on the opposite side of the coin. The last step in our process is capacity. And what capacity is, is the ability to sustain a given intensity or a desired intensity. In the rehabilitation side of the equation, this could be, can I sustain intensity for a given period of time without pain? And for example, this could be someone who Let's say you've established requisite variability to your desired intent. You've given them enough power and they can tolerate load without trouble. But let's say after they perform a task for a certain period of time, they get pain. And so a typical client may be an individual who is a runner and by mile five, that's when they start to hurt. Or even simpler, this could be someone who can only sit for four hours before they start to develop pain. On the performance side of things, this would be one's capability to perhaps play through a full game without fatiguing or still being able to perform necessary to help achieve a goal of winning. This could be being able to give a, or perform an exercise duration for a prolonged period of time. Or if I go back to my runner, Maybe it's not by mile five they start to get pain, but maybe it's by mile five they fatigue and they slow way down. These would all be problems of capacity that need to be addressed. Let's summarize what we talked about today. So, the goal. The goal is to help our individuals achieve whatever they desire from a health and performance standpoint. There's four wheels, four pieces that help us achieve that goal. We have physical activity, which is what we focused on today. We have sleep, we have nutrition, and we have stress management. When we're talking about physical activity, we must undergo a process to help maximize all the qualities that an individual needs from a physical standpoint to excel at health or performance. That process involves knowledge first, the understanding to perform a given task. Next in line would be variability. That's the ability to move within a desirable range to perform a given task. The next step would be power, the ability to produce a desired intensity in a given task. And last but not least, capacity the ability to sustain a given intensity to perform a desired task. Deciding to what extent you need to intervene on all these areas is entirely idiosyncratic to an individual's needs. And you must ask yourself the question, to what extent is this variable the rate limiting step that is preventing my individuals or even myself to achieving a desired health or performance goal. So what I want you guys to do, because I've outlined this process, is to think back to someone you're working with, either now or in the past, and where are their rate limiting steps to achieving their goals? And what interventions or activities did you utilize to address those rate limiting steps? Leave that in the comments below and let's discuss. Let's all get better. If you want to learn more or dive a little bit deeper into what we talked about today, check out my article that I've linked below. That goes into how I use this process on a few different clients um, from a rehabilitation standpoint. You can also check out some of the videos below on the active mid stance test, the functional squat, and the Copenhagen adductor or adduction test, I should say. Thank you guys for watching. Stay hungry, keep moving, keep learning, and I'll catch you next time.